Okay, so as I said before uh, the lunch break, I would like to continue a little bit uh, concerning uh, the decomposition because we shall use this during the practical. So I think it's better to, uh, to give a very short introduction about the decomposition. So, as I explained, So as I explained this morning, uh, the decomposition, parametric decomposition, is a uh, the concept, okay? But it is a philosophy. The philosophy it means that uh, I'm trying to uh, to keep the physical dimension of uh, the pixel, the parametric physical dimension of the pixel, after any uh, data processing. So remember that uh, if I take the speckle filtering. The input will be coherency matrix. The output will be also coherency matrix. But during the speckle filtering, what is a very simple data processing we did? We did some averaging. So it means that the output will be somewhere an estimation of the average of the coherency matrix. And uh, Applying averaging, in fact, is going to destroy the physical parametric dimension of the picture. So I'm going to destroy this concept. So I'm going to start with the input, which is a coherency matrix for one given pixel. So remember what we said. We said that uh, this pixel has a parametric dimension equal to five. It means that I have five degrees of freedom. This pixel is also represented by the coherency matrix. The coherency matrix is described by nine parameters. And we have seen that uh, these nine parameters are not independent, but they are linked together with four different target equations. So like that, the coherency matrix, even if it is described using nine parameters, this coherency matrix has five degrees of freedom. So everything is perfect. Now, if I apply speckle filter, it means that somewhere I'm going to average. It means that somewhere all the equations which link the parameters together, I have introduced before, are going to be transformed in, in equations. So what does it mean? It means that uh, the line parameter which describes the coherency matrix now are becoming independent due to the fact that I have no more equations, but I have inequations. So due to this fact, it means that uh, the pixel at the output of the speckle filter will have a parametric dimension equal to nine. So at the input, it's equal to five. At the output, it's equal to nine. So there is a problem. The problem can be solved if I introduce this concept of a decomposition. I'm going to decompose my output pixel in a pixel which will present five degrees of freedom and another pixel which present the remaining five degrees of freedom. So to illustrate this concept, it is exactly the same thing if you take a picture, for example, you take a picture of a, of a tree or forest, which is moving due to the wind. So imagine the first scattering matrix corresponds to a first picture. You have uh, the trees like that. Then you take uh, a few seconds later, a second image, second scattering matrix. Well, the trees change a little bit. Then you take uh, another picture, the trees, continue to change, then another pixel, etc., etc., And then you are going to average all these pixels. So the result will be a, a kind of a picture which is not very clear, which is not very clear. This is what we call an average target or distributed target. So the idea is to decompose, to clean this picture, to focus this picture in order to reconstruct a mean target, mean target which will present five degrees of freedom. So this is the concept of the decomposition, the parametric decomposition, to reconstruct 
something which has a physical dimension equal to five. So there exists a, a lot of different decomposition, which are presented here. I shall not present all of them. I shall just focus uh, this afternoon only on two of them, two families of them. And uh, if you are interested, we shall continue tomorrow morning in the next part of, uh, of the lecture. So here you have different uh, decomposition theorem, which can be applied on the different descriptors I have presented to you before lunch. So we, there exists some decomposition, what we call coherent decomposition, which can be applied on the scattering matrix. But remember, the scattering matrix is dependent on this random phase, this uh, absolute phase, so it's very difficult to do this kind of decomposition. So this is why I shall not present this kind of uh, family of decomposition, because I don't agree with uh, this kind of uh, approach. There, is, there exists also some uh, decomposition, which are, are called target dichotomy, which can be applied on the Keno matrix. So the high net decomposition, which was the first one, and the bounds, the enzyme. And then you have a great collection, which can be applied on the coherency matrix or on the covalence matrix, because remember, these two descriptors are equivalent. So we have the first family, which is based on the decomposition or the eigenvector of decomposition. And we have the second family, which is a model-based decomposition. And we can mix some of them, which create uh, the eigenvector, eigenvalues analysis plus model-based decomposition, which was proposed by uh, Van Zyl and Harry. And you have uh, the last family, which is only applied on the eigenvectors and eigenvalues analysis. So what I propose just to present to you this afternoon is the decomposition we did with the Shen Cloud. And I shall make a brief presentation of uh, the family of decomposition, which are model-based decomposition. OK, so let's start with the Cloud and Poitier decomposition. Uh, I don't like uh, this, uh, this appellation. I prefer the entropy and isotropy alpha decomposition. So the idea was the following. The idea was to, uh, after the applying of speaker filter, the idea is to reconstruct something which has a physical dimension equal to five. So it means I'm going to play with the Hagen values. I'm going to play with the Hagen vectors. And then I'm going to introduce new parameters based on the Hagen values, which are the entropy, parametric entropy, and the parametric anisotropy. OK, so let's start with the uh, output coherency matrix, which is this one, okay, which is a result of an average of a different coherency matrices. Okay, from this coherency matrix, I'm going to derive the eigenvector and eigenvalues. It's classical, it's not difficult. So we remember that uh, this uh, coherency matrix is a Hermitian matrix. So it means that by definition, by definition, the Hagen values are real. They are not complex. They are real from a mathematical point of view. And the Hagen vectors are orthogonal. This is something very important. So it means that I have three orthogonal Hagen vectors, which are equivalent to the target vector that I presented to you this morning. So it means that I, I can reconstruct three orthogonal scattering mechanisms. And I have three real again values, which are positive. And from them, I can reconstruct or I can define what we call the pseudo probabilities of a scattering occurring, which are given here. So this is the ratio of a one again value divided by the sum of the Hagen value. OK. So the idea was the following. We define uh, and we introduce the model, the model of the Hagen vector. Remember that uh, this Hagen vector are orthogonal and they are unitary Hagen vector. It means that uh, the norm of this Hagen vector is equal to one. Well, this is a very simple model. There is a very simple model of a complex vector, which is unit. 
and which is given here. Okay, so this vector has three components. So the first component is a cosine of angle. The second component is the sine of angle multiplied by cos of another angle, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And if I derive the norm vector, this norm will be equal to one. So this is a classical, mathematical, complex model of a vector. Okay? So I can introduce this vector, this model for the first second vector. I can introduce the same model for the second second vector and the same model for the third again vector with different uh, angles, alpha 1, beta 1, delta 1, gamma 1, and phi 1 for, for the third again vector, alpha 2, beta 2, delta 2, gamma 2 for the second vector, and alpha 3, beta 3, uh, gamma 3, delta 3 for the third again vector. So like that, uh, I can describe each again vector with a different set of parameters, alpha, beta, delta, and gamma. Okay? So this is the model of my eigenvector. Now what I'm going to do, I'm going to make a, a mean, a mean of this parameter, a mean of uh, this angle. And I'm going to create these average parameters. I'm going to create uh, the average alpha parameter, the average beta parameter, the average gamma parameter, and the average delta parameter. We can see that uh, all these parameters are constructed from each angle which describes each eigenvector. So I have the information of each eigenvector multiplied by the probability which are constructed from the eigenvalues. So conclusion, the average parameters are function both of the eigenvalue and both of the eigenvector. I'm using all the information of the coherency matrix. I'm not going to lose any information. I use all the information, the eigenvector and the eigenvalues. So <coughs> I can reconstruct the unitary target vector, which has exactly the same model, cosinus alpha, sinus alpha, cosinus beta, exponential g delta, sinus alpha, sinus beta, exponential g gamma, with the average parameters. Okay? But here, I have one, two, three, and four independent parameters. So conclusion, this unitary target vector has a physical dimension equal to four because it is constructed from four independent parameters. Remember that I need, I need a physical dimension equal to five. So one physical dimension is missing. But here you have a unitary target vector. So what we have to do, we have just to add some magnitude information. And to do that, I shall create the final target vector of the pixel, k naught, which is constructed from the unitary vector q naught we just see the definition, multiplied by the target magnitude, which is constructed from the average of the eigenvalue. Conclusion of the conclusion, this is the result of my decomposition. Okay, so as the input, it is an average coherency matrix with a physical dimension equal to nine. Okay, so it's not good from a physical point of view. I apply the eigenvalues eigenvector decomposition. I use the eigenvalues and I use the eigenvector information to create this average target vector, which will be the output of my decomposition. And this target vector is constructed from one, two, three, four, five independent parameters. So this target vector has a physical dimension equal to five. And this is the result. So this is the result here using the, the poly representation. So on the left, you have the original image before the speckled filtering. And on the right, you have the resulting image after the speckled filtering and after the decomposition. So you can see that these two images are quite the same. Okay. 
So it means that I have not, I have not lost information, I have not created information, I have just applied my decomposition, and now I'm sure that each pixel presents a physical dimension equal to five. So this is physics. This is physics. So something which is very important is uh, what we call the role invariant property. So what does it mean? It means that uh, during the measurements, you can imagine that uh, not for a space bomb, but for an air bomb center, the air bomb system is moving during, uh, during the measurement. So it means that uh, from a parametric point of view, it is equivalent to introduce a rotation, a rotation of the antenna along the radar line of sight. So in such a case, the coherency matrix will be equal to the original coherency matrix, multiply by the rotation matrix, which corresponds to the fluctuation of the antenna or to the fluctuation of the plane. Okay, so this is very interesting, and this occurs very often. But something which is very, very, very important is that if I derive the eigenvalues of this uh, rotated <coughs> coherency matrix, <coughs> the eigenvalues are always the same, always the same. So it means that the eigenvalues are very important parameters and are what we call role invariant parameters. They are independent of the fluctuation of the plane. They are independent of the rotation of the antenna. So this is really very important. So the eigenvalues are really important, and so the probabilities are also really invariant because they are constructed from the eigenvalues. And to finish, if I have a look to the Hegel vector, now if I apply the rotation matrix to the, to the Hegel vector, for sure the Hegel vectors change because they are sensitive to the rotation. But among all these parameters, alpha, beta, delta, gamma, only one, only one is independent of the rotation, which is the alpha parameter. So alpha one, alpha two, and alpha three are still the same after the rotation. So it means that the average alpha parameters we introduced just before, which is constructed from alpha 1, alpha 2, and alpha 3, and also P1, P2, P3, is a role invariant parameter. So alpha play, average alpha, play also a very important role in this decomposition because now we can give a physical interpretation of this parameter, which is, I recall, which is, I remember, which is independent of the fluctuation of the plane, which is independent of the fluctuation of the antenna. Yeah, we suppose, uh, we suppose, yeah, uh, we suppose by definition. So it's not the case, it would be, uh, it's not the case for sure, inside your pixel you have a different scattering mechanism, but here we are using a coherency matrix, which is a three by three coherency matrix. Okay, and this coherency matrix is constructed from the target vector. I am going to apply the eigenvalues and eigenvector decomposition. By definition, I shall get three eigenvectors, only three eigenvectors, and each eigenvector is associated to a scattering mechanism. And more of that. I have three orthogonal eigenvectors. So it means I can reconstruct from a mathematical point of view three orthogonal scattering mechanisms. Okay. So this is uh, something which is a model. This is a model. We shall see uh, after with the model based decomposition. Here also we suppose, we suppose that uh, we have uh, only three different uh, uh, scattering mechanisms. And we try to reconstruct uh, each of them. Okay, so this this approach for removing the nuts. So first of all, uh, we have to construct uh, the four by four coherency matrix. Four by four coherency matrix. Okay, so it means actually to go back. Uh, it means that in such a case, yeah, 
Terminamos a grande. Aqui. Outra. Exato. Aqui. Okay. So if you want if you want to do that, <coughs> first of all you have not to consider HV equal VH. Okay, so you take the four images, four images, and you construct the four components of this uh, of this uh, vector. From this, from this, you will get a coherency matrix by construction, which will be a four by four coherency matrix. Then you will derive the four eigenvalues, the four eigenvalues. And then you will subtract the fourth eigenvalue to the three. And then you will reconstruct the three by three coherency matrix. You will neglect the last components for each eigenvector. You will neglect the last eigenvalue because it will be equal to zero. It will be lambda four minus lambda four. And then like that, you can come back to uh, the three by three coherency matrix. Okay, so pure target, we call pure targets only one pixel. So only one pixel, I have only one scattering matrix. For one scattering matrix, I have only one coherency matrix. And this is what I said in the definition. In such a case, the coherency matrix is rank one, rank one. So it means that the determinant of this coherency matrix is equal to zero, okay? I shall get only one eigenvalue, none zero. The other eigenvalues are equal to zero, okay? So this is a rank one matrix. This is what we call a pure target, pure target. Now, a distributed target is when you are going to average, average the different uh, coherency matrices for one matrix. The resulting of this coherency matrix will be a rank three matrix, a rank three matrix. So the determinant is no more equal to zero. And then you will get three again values, none equal to zero, positive again values. This is what we call a distributed target. Okay. Pure target, physical dimension equal to five, only one eigenvalue, distributed target, physical dimension equal to nine, be careful, we have to reduce, and you have three eigenvalues different to zero. Yes, I'm going back. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so you have seen that uh, if I apply this rotation, uh, the eigenvalues are all invariant, so it means they are independent of this rotation. And this alpha parameter is also all invariant because it is independent of uh, this uh, rotation. So this is very important. It means that uh, whatever the configuration of the acquisition, we can continue to extract physical interpretation of these parameters. So we derive with a Shen cloud uh, the physical interpretation of this alpha parameter. So it's, it has been published several times. And we can see that uh, when alpha is close to zero, with when the angle alpha is close to zero, this corresponds to single band scattering mechanism. When alpha is close to 90 degrees, this corresponds to double bond scattering mechanism. And when alpha is close to 45 degrees, this corresponds to volume scattering mechanism. Okay, so this is a corresponding alpha image. And so we can see that on the C surface, where the alpha parameter is, uh, is close to zero, this corresponds to single bond scattering mechanism. In the urban area, you have distinct pixels. Uh, with a very high value of uh, alpha parameter, which correspond to double bond capturing mechanism. And uh, otherwise, you have a, a mixture between yellow, green color. So it means uh, you can have a combination between a double bond capturing mechanism and volume capturing mechanism. 
as I realized because it was the first parameter, first parameter we derived and we were able to, to, to provide very simple and very basic uh, scattering interpretation using this parameter. Okay. The physical meaning of delta and gamma, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. Okay, so if you have an idea, I hope I'm very pleased to receive a, uh, your uh, proposal about uh, the definition of delta and gamma. Uh, I work on uh, on this parameter when it was a pure target. It was a pure target. Um, <coughs> we were able from the beta parameter to reconstruct a, a part a part of the orientation of the target along the radar line of sight. We know that uh, the target can be aligned between uh, between zero to two pi. Okay, so I can turn my target with a beta parameter. I can uh, reconstruct uh, only a part from zero to ninety degrees. I can just have an estimation between zero and ninety degrees of the rotation. So it's not enough if uh, I want to cover the two pi rotation uh, range. And for a pure target, it was possible to, to use the delta and the gamma uh, angle to reconstruct the complement of this uh, rotation angle. So to reconstruct from uh, minus 90 degrees to plus 90 degrees and from zero to, uh, to pi. And then it was possible to reconstruct the full dynamic of the, of the, of the rotation angle. But this is okay for a pure target. For average target, I don't know. Uh, there is no obvious physical interpretation of this uh, parameter. So this is linked to the intercorrelation between the, the different channels, but it's very difficult to, to give a physical interpretation. Okay, so uh, this method proposed by uh, IECS, I know because I work on that with them. Uh, so, in fact, it was a, a mix of uh, using SRTM because the idea was to, uh, to project uh, on the surface, the normal of the surface, and to have an estimation of the orientation angle. So, we did exactly the same with uh, John Sandy and Del Schuller about the slope, the slope estimation. And from this uh, slope estimation, uh, we, we had the same uh, limits of uh, the dynamics. It was each time between uh, uh, minus, uh, five minus 45 degrees to plus 45 degrees. And we did not have all the coverage of the orientation angle. Okay. But uh, I would be very interested to, uh, to continue to work on this uh, interpretation of the delta and the gamma parameter, but it is rather, rather difficult. Okay, so if we continue the presentation of this approach, so the next step was to introduce uh, now the well-known uh, parametric entropy parameter. And in fact, uh, we had the idea when reading a book on uh, thermodynamics theory. And in uh, thermodynamics, uh, there exists this uh, concept of uh, entropy, which was proposed by von Neumann, and uh, which concerns the stability of the gas. Okay. So this is the entropy. This one is a thermodynamic entropy. It is not uh, the entropy proposed by Shannon. Okay. The entropy proposed by Shannon, I shall show you later. It is something different. The entropy proposed by Shannon is a degree of a quantity of information, uh, which was proposed in a data transmission. Here, no, here it is uh, the entropy defined by von Neumann, uh, the thermodynamics uh, about uh, the stability of the gas. Okay. So we extend this definition to our case because this entropy is defined from uh, probabilities and we have probabilities uh, constructed from the Hegel values. And so we derive this, uh, this relation, uh, the entropy which is equal to minus uh, sub uh, of the probability uh, logarithm uh, basis free multiplied by the, by the probability. And uh, if we have a look to this parameter, this uh, parameter 
could vary between zero to one. And when the entropy is close to zero, it means that uh, in such a case, uh, I have only one eigenvalue which is not equal to zero. The two of the eigenvalues are equal to zero. So what does it mean? It means that inside the pixel, I shall have only one, one very important scattering mechanism. I don't know which one, but I'm sure that I shall get only one scattering mechanism. On the contrary, uh, the entropy can reach its maximum value, which is equal to one. In such a case, it means that the three eigenvalues will be equal. So lambda one equal lambda two equal lambda three. What does it mean? It means that uh, inside of my pixel, I shall get three independent and orthogonal scattering mechanisms. The maximum of scattering mechanism I can distinguish inside my pixel. So what does it mean from a stability point of view? If I have only one scattering mechanism, it means that I shall have only one target, what we call a pure target, with a physical dimension equal to five, no problem. On the contrary, when my entropy will be very high, it means that inside my pixel, I have several scattering mechanisms. So I have a random scattering mechanism. And so the entropy will be very high. So I need absolutely to apply my decomposition. OK. And so this is uh, the result of the image of entropy. So you can see that on C surface, you have entropy very low close to zero, so it means that I have only one single scattering mechanism. And on the contrary, on the park, I shall have an entropy very high, close to one, so it means that inside each pixel, I shall have several scattering mechanisms. So for the trees, or for the forest, or for the, the, the parks, uh, we, we, we know that we can have three different scattering mechanisms. So imagine you have a forest with your trees, you can have a single bond on the top of the trees, uh, on the canopy, so it is a single bond. Then you can have a propagation and you can have a double bond scattering mechanism between the tree and the ground, so it is a second scattering mechanism. And the third scattering mechanism corresponds to the multiple interaction inside the canopy, so what we call the volume scattering mechanism. So inside the pixel where I have my different trees, I can get the three orthogonal scattering mechanisms. So I shall have the entropy very close to one, very high value of entropy. The next uh, parameter, which is complementary to the to the entropy, is the anisotropy. So we we, we took this also in a, in the thermodynamics of theory, and uh, we construct this parametric anisotropy from the two small eigenvalues lambda two and lambda three. So remember that uh, these two small eigenvalues correspond to the secondary scattering mechanism inside the pixel. So this information is very useful when the entropy is very high. When the entropy is very low, uh, this information is not really very useful. And is very useful because we can discriminate different kinds of a scattering mechanism. OK, so this is the variation of uh, the entropy and the entropy. And well, the most important, most interesting is this image. So this is the image of the anisotropy, okay? Personally, personally, I don't know how to interpret this image. If, if you provide to me uh, this uh, image of anisotropy, only this image, it will be difficult to find a physical interpretation because, because you can have, a, for the same value of anisotropy, different value of entropy. So it means that uh, for a given pixel where I shall have only one scattering mechanism, entropy will be close to zero and anisotropy will be also close to zero. And if I take a pixel where I have three scattering mechanisms, entropy will be high, but anisotropy will also be equal to zero. So in the two opposite cases, anisotropy will be the same. So it's very, very difficult to make an analysis of the anisotropy image alone. So this is why I said that we need we need these two images at the same time to have a physical interpretation of the different scattering mechanism which can occur inside the pixel. So we have to analyze at the same time 
entropy and anisotropy. So the best way to uh, to make this kind of analysis is to construct is to construct the combination the combination between entropy and anisotropy. So this is why we are going to construct these four combinations. One minus entropy multiplied by one minus anisotropy. Entropy multiplied by one minus anisotropy. Anisotropy multiplied by one minus entropy. And the last one, entropy multiplied by anisotropy. And here, this is very interesting. Because according to the range of entropy and anisotropy, if I take, for example, the first combination here, using this combination can uh, extract all the pixels which present only one single scattering mechanism. Only one single scattering mechanism. I don't know which one, but I'm sure that I shall have only one scattering mechanism. The second uh, combination, this one, is very important because we can extract the pixel where I shall have three independent capturing mechanism inside the pixel. And this combination is very useful when you want, or if you want, to make some vegetation detection. Okay, this, it works perfectly. It works perfectly if I want to make some forest detection or forest, non-forest discrimination. This combination is very, very powerful. And you can see, that uh, I detect uh, all the pixels where I have a volume scattering mechanism, and I can even detect uh, all the trees, uh, the trees along the boulevard. Okay, so this is very nice. The second, uh, or the third, sorry, the third. This one, entropy multiplied by anisotropy, corresponds to the pixels where I have two, two scattering mechanisms, very important. And usually, this occurs in urban areas. Because if you consider a building or a house, you will get a single bounce from the from the roof of the, of the building, from the top of the building, and you can have a, at the same time a double bounce between this building and the parking, for example, inside the same pixel. So you can have the contribution of a two important scattering mechanism. So this can be useful to detect man-man target in a in a natural environment. And the last one. The last one, this one is very nice also. It corresponds to the pixel where I have a very strong scattering mechanism plus, plus the second one, which is not important, but which is not so negligible, so negligible. Okay, and here, what you can see, you can see that uh, you can detect all the pixels along the coast. And this is uh, really very interesting because uh, Imagine you make a transect. You will have the open sea on the left side. So open sea is a raw surface, raw surface, small roughness. So you will get only one very important single bond, scattering mechanism, one scattering mechanism. And when you are close to the coast, you to the ground, which uh, propagate and uh, scatter by the coast, will create a more rough surface. So this is why the sea close to the coast is really more rough. So on this wave, you will get a single bounce on the top of the wave, plus, 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 a small double bounce between the waves, which is a characteristic of this kind of a wave along the coast. And so you can detect this using this combination. So remember, one scattering mechanism, three scattering mechanism, two important scattering mechanism, and one scattering mechanism plus a second. Aha, dual pool data. Okay, so this is, uh, I can reset. Uh, this is what I would like to explain to you tomorrow morning. Because uh, two years ago, I have seen a lot of person who make a lot of confusion. Uh, and try to, uh, to to apply what I'm presenting to you now, which is only valid in the fully parametric case. It is not at all valid 
il est dual pour K. OK? So, this is very important. So, I shall show you tomorrow. For example, a lot of people say, OK, I'm going to derive uh, the entropy and uh, the alpha parameter. We can do it. We can do it in the dual pole case because it is just a, a mathematical approach from the covariance matrix. I can derive again values, so I can construct uh, entropy. I can construct uh, uh, alpha parameter. OK, I can do that. But, but the physical interpretation is not at all the same thing. Here, I can give to you a physical interpretation because I have the information of the free channel, HH, HG, and VV. I have all the information of the scattering matrix. I have all the information of the fully parametric data. So I can provide this information. This information is valid for this case. In the dual pole case, by definition, I'm going to lose one channel. So I shall, I shall not have the same information. So if I have not the same information, it's not possible to have exactly the same physical interpretation. Okay? And I shall show you uh, tomorrow morning that uh, in the dual pole case, we can make a lot of mistakes. So what I'm going to explain to you, remember it is only valid for the fully parametric case, not at all for other kind of parametric. So I have different question. to tech tech. My audio cut out for a second. So yeah, so you have the answer. One mechanism plus another one which is lower. Okay. And the parametric parameter change with local incidence angle for the same target. Yes, yes, yeah, yeah. The most uh, significant example is the double bounce. Yeah, double bounce. By hydro, by hydro. You get this effect when you have only 45 degrees of local incidence. If I move a little bit, I move a little bit my local incidence, my, do my double bounce becomes one single bounce. Okay? So the alpha parameter will change, will change. Okay, so if we continue, this is the exam of uh, the decomposition uh, we did with the chain. So what we call the entropy and the entropy alpha decomposition, because the most important parameters uh, concern these uh, three uh, parameters, the entropy and the entropy alpha, and uh, you will see that we can do a lot of things. With it. Also with tomography, also with uh, Polinsa, they, they are using uh, this kind of, uh, of information also. Okay, so if we continue, so I, I shall skip this part. Uh, so I shall present this tomorrow morning. So an example of the current uh, decomposition. I shall present tomorrow morning something about the target dichotomy uh, on this eigenvector based decomposition. And here, so I'm just going to make a, a small break here uh, to present uh, some uh, philosophy about the model based decomposition because. Uh, we can, uh, we can make an exercise using the model-based decomposition during the practical. So you can say that uh, we have a long list of uh, scientists working on that topic. And uh, we have new, new, new decomposition, new approaches. Uh, each year we have a, we have a new publication uh, about uh, this model-based decomposition. But this is very important, this is very important. This is another kind of family of decomposition, model-based. Okay, so here are some uh, colleagues uh, working on this uh, approach. So the father of the model-based decomposition is uh, Tony Freeman, uh, Steve Durden, which are on the top of uh, this slide. Then uh, we had Yamaguchi and uh, Singh uh, were working on, uh, on the extension of this model-based decomposition. And today we have a lot, we have a lot of contributors working, uh, working on this model-based decomposition. 
Okay, so just to give you a basic uh, presentation of uh, what is a model-based decomposition. So we are going to start with a uh, with, uh, decomposition proposed by Freeman and Durden. And so, as I said, this is a model. This is a model. So they consider that uh, in each pixel, each pixel, there exist three contributions. One contribution coming from a single band scattering mechanism. Then you have a, a double band scattering mechanism, and then you have a volume scattering mechanism. So by definition, in each pixel, I have this model. So for sure, for each pixel, I shall not add exactly the same amount of uh, this different uh, scattering mechanism. For some pixel, I shall have uh, a lot of single band scattering mechanism and quite lighting corresponding to double bonds and volume, and for another pixel, it will be the contrary, etc., etc. But the starting point is to integrate this model for the definition of the global scattering mechanism. So now, the idea is to find the model of each of them. What can be the theoretical coherency matrix corresponding to a single bond scattering mechanism? What can be the theoretical coherency matrix of a double bond scattering mechanism? And what can be the theoretical matrix of a volume scattering mechanism? So this is what I'm going to, to present to you. For single bonds, we are starting with, a, with this, this surface, this round surface, with the corresponding scattering matrix. And in such a case, the scattering matrix is represented by the horizontal and vertical Fresnel coefficient. Okay, so this is very simple. For this kind of uh, surface, you have a, a contribution of in the HH channel, a contribution in the VV channel, and you have no depolarization. You have nothing in the HG channel. So from this scattering matrix, I'm going to construct the corresponding target vector. And from the corresponding target vector, I can construct the corresponding coherency matrix of a single scattering mechanism, which is given here. Then I'm going to introduce some parameter, Fs, which correspond to the contribution of the single band, and beta, which will uh, which correspond to the ratio between the Fresnel coefficient. Okay, so this is a model. This is a model of a perfect surface. So this is a model of the coherency, coherency matrix corresponding of the scattering mechanism. Okay? Now we continue with the double bonds. Double bonds, we can consider the ideal case of a double bonds between a building and a surface. So in such a case, in such a case, the scattering matrix will be uh, given by this matrix, which corresponds to the product of the horizontal Fresnel coefficient of the ground and of the trunk or the ground in the building, and uh, the contribution in the vertical polarization of the ground and of the trunk also. Okay, so in the ideal case, I have no depolarization. I can construct the corresponding target vector, and from the corresponding target vector, I can construct the corresponding coherency matrix. This is a coherency matrix of the double band scattering mechanism where I shall introduce FD, which is a proportion of the double bond, and alpha, which is defined as a ratio of the different Fresnel coefficient. Okay, so this is the second model. And the third model corresponding to the volume scattering, I'm going to go into, into the details, but I'm going to consider that the tree, in fact, can be, uh, can be seen as a cloud of a dipole. And each dipole can represent a branch or a leaf or a needle, what, what you want. Okay, so in fact, the idea is to create uh, the coherency matrix of a cloud of dipoles. Okay, so let's start with only one dipole, which is given by this scattering, matri scattering uh, matrix. A and B correspond to the reflection along the dipole. But in the cloud of dipole, I have not 
warm dipole and I have different oriented dipole. Okay, so no problem. I can derive the scattering matrix of an oriented dipole, which is a scattering matrix of a horizontal dipole multiplied by the rotation matrix. Okay, so this is the scattering matrix of an oriented dipole. Now, inside the cloud, I have a lot of dipoles. So what I'm going to, 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 to do to derive the corresponding coherence matrix, I'm going to average over all, all the possible rotation of the scat of the, of the, all the dipoles. So this is why I'm going to integrate from zero to two pi the coherence matrix of one dipole multiplied by the distribution of the rotation which is a uniform uh, orientation, which is equal to 1 over 2 pi. And like that, I can uh, derive a theoretical coherency matrix corresponding to volume scattering mechanism, which is given here. Okay, so in conclusion, to summarize, I have derived, I have derived three coherency matrices which correspond to each scattering mechanism. So now if I come back to my model, so I say that uh, inside the pixel, I have the contribution of the single bands plus contribution of the double bands plus contribution of the volume scattering mechanism. So in fact, I take the three coherency matrices and I add the three coherency matrices. And the objective is to reconstruct the parameter fs, the parameter beta, the parameter fd, the parameter alpha, and the parameter fv. So like that, you can have an idea of the different uh, proportionalities of the different scattering mechanisms from the measurements. So the measurements are given here, t11, t12, t22, and t33. This is the coherency matrix of the pixel. So this is only a, a system. I have just to invert the system and to reconstruct my uh, unknowns, my observables. I have just a problem. I have just a problem in the sense that I have only four observed equations, which are given here by the four coefficients, t11, t12, t22, t and t33. I have, and I have five unknown coefficients to reconstruct. So in fact, I have not enough observation to reconstruct my coefficients. So the idea of Freeman was the following. I'm going to introduce a rule, a rule, which is given here. So it was the idea of, uh, of Freeman. If uh, this uh, relation here is positive, then I'm going to fix alpha to one. If uh, this relation is negative, then I'm going to fix beta equal to one. So it means that after, I shall have four equations for four unknowns. And then I can reconstruct, I can reconstruct these five parameters, which correspond to the model based decomposition. And then this coefficient here will give to you the proportionality of the single bounds which hook you inside the pixel. This coefficient which provide to you the proportionality of double bounds, and this coefficient provides the proportionality of volume scattering. So this is a kind of decomposition, and this is more a kind of a representation of the information according to the model which is introduced. So how we can see the volume scattering from here or some regular chip. Wait a minute, wait a minute. Concerning the edX element, I shall come uh, to this later. So it was a question before I don't understand. Oh, we can see the volume scattering from sphere or some irregular chip scatterer.
Okay, I'm just going to ask to Arun if he can uh, rewrite this question because I don't uh, understand what he means. Uh, Elix, I come, uh, I'm just going to present after that. Uh, also, in this case, remember then, if I want to know, for example, the thing, uh, only relative to the surface. Yes, okay, okay. Yes, you can do that. You can do that. Because with this decomposition, you can reconstruct the equivalent equivalent for each pixel. You can reconstruct the equivalent, for example, of the coherency matrix of the single bonds. And from this reconstructed coherency matrix, I can reconstruct the equivalent covariance matrix. And from the equivalent covariance matrix, I take the C11 and I shall get the sigma net HH of uh, the single bond capturing mechanism. Okay, so this is one advantage. I can reconstruct for each pixel the covariance matrix, if you want, corresponding to single bonds, the covariance matrix corresponding to double bonds, and the covariance matrix corresponding to volume scattering. Okay, so we are here, and we get this result. So I have constructed the equivalent of the poly matrix. So what is the conclusion? We can say that, uh, in fact, I have an overestimation, overestimation of a volume scattering, because you can see that the image is green. Yeah? You have uh, quite a saturation of the green. What does it mean? It means that uh, I have an overestimation of uh, the volume scattering mechanism. So this is a drawback of the approach proposed by, uh, by Freeman and Dirt. Overestimation of the volume scattering mechanism. So this is the first drawback. The second drawback is that uh, the, the model-based decomposition is valid only on an area where you have what we call a symmetry in the reflectivity. So it means no decorrelation between HV and HH and HV and VV. And it is not always the case. This is a problem. You have you in a natural environment, you have always some correlation between HV and HH, NV and VV. So this is why, this is why Yamaguchi took exactly the same model, the same model, but introduced a four element, the fourth element. So what we call the model based four component decomposition. So this is this model. He wanted to have this model more general model because he considered uh, environment without reflection symmetry. So it means that uh, this kind of environment presents a correlation between HV and HH, NV and V. So this is why he took exactly the same model, same model, or single bound, or double bound, or volume scattering, exactly the same model, exactly the same coherency matrices. But he had a fourth catching mechanism, which is we, what we call the helix catching mechanism. So what is an helix? An helix is like a spiral, so it doesn't exist in the nature. So it is a modelization of a something which is completely non-symmetric. Okay? So usually, you can derive this kind of uh, matrix from a, from a theoretical approach. And you get uh, this corresponding coherency matrix of the helix. So like that, you are going to increase the number of equations. And so like that, you can have a better estimation of the volume scattering. Because remember that uh, the conclusion is that we have another estimation of the volume scattering. So we are trying to reduce a little bit the estimation of the volume scattering. So we can reduce it by introducing this uh, helix scattering mechanism. And so this is the result, the result of the Yamaguchi decomposition, which provides a better result compared to the Freeman, which is here. So on the left, you have the Freeman decomposition, and on the right, you have the Yamaguchi decomposition. And then it was a new starting point. The new starting point today is a this four model based decomposition and uh, a postdoc of uh, of Yamaguchi who is now a professor in India Singh 
continue to work on this approach and trying to go more into the details about uh, the definition of uh, these different uh, four component decomposition. So I have it here some uh, some publication of Singh and Yamaguchi, and this is the result of the Singh decomposition. So using also four different uh, uh, components and using also an estimation of the rotation angle inside the, the pixel. Okay, so if we compare on the right the Singh result of the decomposition and on the left the Yamaguchi decomposition. So we have a better, a better interpretation, a better result of this decomposition. And then people continue to work on that. And we have new ideas. We have what we call the model base four, five, and even six component decomposition. So they consider, for example, that inside the pixel, you can have two die draw, which are, uh, not close together, and uh, the combination of uh, these two double bonds can create a non-symmetric phenomenon. So it can be uh, something to uh, to consider and uh, trying to extract this uh, specific uh, components contribution. Okay, so people continue to work and to introduce four, five, six component decomposition. But we have to be careful. We have to be careful. Because we have to remember that the physical dimension of a pixel is equal to five, five, five independent parameters. So I'm not so sure that uh, trying to reconstruct uh, six components as uh, physics means something from a physical point of view. Because you are going to increase the number of uh, degree of freedom, which is not possible, which is not the case. So you have to be careful. Three is okay, four can be okay, five is the limit, six, we can discuss about this kind of uh, decomposition. Okay, so I list, I list uh, these different uh, approaches. So all of them are in, included inside Pulsar Pro, so you can play uh, during the practical, okay, so you can, uh, you can compare the different decomposition and you can see the difference. So for example, this is the last one, uh, which correspond to the six, co six component decomposition proposed by C. There is a very uh, nice uh, impact of this kind of decomposition. And this is something which is very interesting. Uh, usually when uh, we test new decomposition, we use San Francisco image. We use San Francisco image because there is one area which is specific and uh, all decomposition give a bad result. So like that, we can immediately conclude if the decomposition is a good one or not. This area is here, is located here, okay? You can see that uh, this area is green. So we could conclude that this is a park area. Not at all, not at all. This is urban area, urban area. But this is oriented urban area, oriented urban area. So due to the orientation, the HV, HV channel is becoming very important. And HV channel, very important, is equivalent to volume scattering. So this is a drawback of this kind of decomposition. When you apply this model, this kind of area will be classified, classified naturally, automatically, in a vegetation class. And it is not at all the case. It is just oriented urban area. Okay, so it's not a nice component. It is just an oriented, oriented area. The streets are oriented. According to the line of sight, it is a pure 45 degrees, pure 45 degrees. So HV is equal to HH, HV is equal to VV. Conclusion, the third eigenvalue is very high. Conclusion of the conclusion, this corresponds to vegetation, which is not the case. So that is something very nice. So, so usually when I get a new decomposition immediately, I apply this new decomposition on, uh, on this kind of uh, image and we can uh, conclude immediately on the efficiency of the decomposition. Yeah, 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 because what does it mean? It means that uh, you try to, uh, to reconstruct from a three by three Coherency matrix, 
different scattering mechanism. Okay, so if uh, I create uh, six components, it means that you have not to forget that uh, what happened in the reality, in the reality, what happened. Inside the pixel, it is a coherent, coherent integration of the different scattering mechanisms. Coherent means a complex interaction, amplitude and phase, amplitude and phase. So I can have 10 scattering mechanism, okay, 10, 20, the number you want. But you have the complex integration which provides the scattering matrix. Now what you are doing, you are trying to decompose from an incoherent point of view, incoherent point of view. Okay, but in such a case, it's not possible. In such a case, it's not possible to have more components than the dimension of the matrix. Okay, so you could play, you will play uh, during the practical, uh, the second part of the practical. And if you have not the time to do it uh, today, you can you can do it uh, at home or next week. Uh, and uh, so you can play to see, uh, to compare the different decomposition. Okay, so if we move to the next one, so I shall present tomorrow, and uh, we can uh, we can conclude this part. Uh, with uh, the eigenvalues, coming back to the eigenvalues, okay? Just just playing with the eigenvalues. And this is uh, what I shall propose to you to do uh, during also the practical. Okay, so some colleagues, some colleagues, uh, so in France, Sophie from my team, or Tom Ensforth from NRL in, uh, in the state, play also with the eigenvalues and uh, succeed to derive some parameters. So we have the polarization fraction, we have the polarization asymmetry. We have the single and double bonds eigenvalue relative difference with, uh, with uh, these eigenvalues. We have the radar vegetation index. We know that uh, this uh, parameter is uh, very useful. We have the pedestal height, uh, which corresponds to the parametric signature. We have the tar target randomness, which was uh, proposed by Lundborg. We have another approach, which was proposed uh, by uh, Prax and Elise Kola, uh, to derive the, uh, the entropy and also the, the alpha parameter without deriving the eigenvalues and eigenvector, uh, which is here. So the approach is a, is a simplification of the entropy. So you can see uh, it is quite the same as the real entropy. And something which is very important is uh, what I said at the beginning, the Shannon parametric entropy. It is, it is another way to present this information of the entropy. Uh, so Shannon, in such a case, it is uh, linked to uh, related to the to the information theory uh, we have in the communication in the communication information theory. So like in, in in such a case, this entropy can be split in two parts. The first part, which corresponds to the change of intensity during the acquisition by the radar. And the second part, which is linked to the degree of polarization of the wave during the acquisition. So you can see that uh, what is changing due to the change of the intensity and what is changing due to the change of the polarization. And this is, uh, we can get more beautiful images, which is the following. So this is the Shannon entropy, Shannon entropy. And this uh, Shannon entropy, as I said, can be uh, split in two parts. The part which is related to the intensity, so on the left side, and the part which is related to the change of polarization of the right part. Okay, so here we have more information uh, compared to the classical entropy we introduced uh, some years ago. And uh, today, today using Shannon entropy uh, can be uh, can be a, a good idea. Uh, which decomposition can interpret physically when I apply on dual pole data? You will see that tomorrow morning. Okay, because the same, same. All what I'm presenting now is valid only for fully parametric data. Okay, fully parametric. Data. All the models I have presented to you are valid 
for fully parametric data, not dual pole data. Okay. So more money, I shall the last part, I shall focus on uh, on the dual pole case. So here I wanted to introduce the concept. I wanted to introduce decomposition. So like that, you have uh, all these steps in your head. And tomorrow morning, it will be more easy to, to, to make the parallel between fully parametry and dual pole case. So like that, you will see that uh, we reduce a lot the number of combinations, the number of decomposition we can, uh, we can apply. Okay, so what time is it? Mm -hmm. can stay. Yeah, well, I'm just going to show you only one one thing, and uh, that's all. Okay, so just to conclude uh, about uh, something we did last century, so in 1996. So at that time, uh, we were very pleased to to get uh, this kind of uh, result. Uh, today, it's, it's ridiculous, but anyway. Uh, so 30 years ago, it was very, very, very nice. It was uh, okay. So the idea was to use only entropy and uh, alpha, and to see if it was possible to do some uh, unsupervised uh, classification. So something very, very, very simple. And so the idea was uh, following. So I'm coming back to, to to that point. So the idea is the following: I take the entropy image, I take the alpha image, I project this information on the plane what we call the entropy alpha plane. Okay, I introduce uh, different uh, areas in this plane, and then each area has a physical meaning, and for each area, I put a, a given color, and the output will be uh, the result of a segmentation. Okay, so this is what we call the entropy alpha plane. So here also, here also, this is valid only in the fully parametric case, okay? Not dual pole case, only fully parametric case. Okay, so in this plane, we derive uh, or we divide this plane in a, in a eight different uh, areas, nine, but uh, only eight are, are, are physical. So each of them correspond to a, to a canonical scattering mechanism. So you have dihedral scattering mechanism, you have dipole scattering, black surface, uh, you have vegetation, you have forestry, double bounds, etc., etc., etc. And so for each area, you have a given color. So we have uh, eight different colors. And this is the result. So this is the result. So without any a priori information, using only entropy, using only alpha information, reconstructed from the eigenvalues, we got this, uh, this image. So we were very proud. Uh, in 1995, 1996, to get this image, it was the first time that it was possible to uh, to reconstruct uh, this kind of uh, information. If we compare uh, what we can do today with uh, what uh, we are able to do uh, a lot of years ago, uh, there is a great improvement in this uh, approach of uh, segmentation. Anyway, anyway, it was funny. It was funny because uh, without any a priori information. So I repeat, uh, using entropy and alpha parameter, I can give a physical interpretation. I can say, ah, this area uh, corresponds to single bound scattering mechanism, and with a low value of alpha, this corresponds to uh, to row surface scattering mechanism. This area corresponds to double bound. This area corresponds to vegetation. But you can see that uh, we have a lot of errors in the classification. And the most important uh, missing information is a power, is an intensity, intensity. Because here I'm using only entropy and alpha. And this parameter, alpha is a angle, okay? So there is no intensity, it is a angle between zero and 90 degrees. And entropy is a parameter between zero and one. So we have not the intensity information. So the idea was uh, proposed some years ago by uh, Kao Fang from uh, the Institute of Electronic uh, in Chinese Academy of Science in uh, her PhD thesis was to uh, split this entropy alpha plane in three different entropy alpha planes. Because you have the physical interpretation in the entropy alpha plane, and according to the value of the intensity, you can separate K 
can separate these different cases. So you will have the result for the low intensity, for the medium intensity, and for the high intensity. And you get uh, the final colors for the final entropy alpha plane. And if I merge all these results, you get uh, this 27, 27 unsupervised classification, which is quite nice. Okay, which is uh, which is quite okay. So using entropy alpha plus plus the intensity. Okay, so with this you will have to do it. And so I'm going to stop here, and I shall I shall present to you uh, the next part uh, using uh, the Wishart distribution. So uh, I shall present this to you uh, to tomorrow morning. Okay, so we can stop here. And so I think that you have enough to do uh, to do the practical.